Welcome to this evening's uh, session, which is a book discussion on The Vanishing Point, Moving Images After Video, which tracks the fugitive afterlife of the post-celluloid moving image. Uh, before we start, I would like to introduce our speakers for this evening. Uh, we have Geeta Patel. Uh, she's a professor at the University of Virginia. Her avid curiosity led her to several degrees in interdisciplinary sciences combined with philosophy, leavened with varied perspectives on South Asia. She has written two academic books and edited three special issues of journals which mingle poetry, politics, law, science, media, colonialism, nations and states, sexuality, policy, political economy and financialization. Thank you so much for being here, Geeta. Uh, Paramita Vora is a filmmaker and writer whose work explores feminism, love and desire, urban life and popular culture. Her work has been broadcast and is taught internationally and exhibited at the National Gallery of Modern Art, the Tate Modern and the Wellcome Trust. She is the founder and creative director of Agents of Ishq, India's best loved website about sex, love and desire. Thanks for being here so much. Uh, Rashmi, sorry. Rashmi is Associate Professor of Cultural Studies at Christ University, Bangalore, where she is the academic coordinator of the MA and PhD programs in cultural studies. She writes on cinema and the visual arts, and her book, The Vanishing Point, Moving Images After Video, was published in 2022 by Tulika Books in Columbia University Press. Thanks you, Rashmi, for being here. And our moderator for this evening is Bindu uh, Menon Manil. Bindu teaches media studies at Azim Premji University in Bangalore. Her research-based writings on South Indian history, gender and film work, sound studies, video cultures and media and migration have been published in peer-reviewed journals. She also engages in public writing in these areas in English and Malayalam language media. We're hosting this session as a run-up to the Urban Lens Film Festival, which will be starting next week from the 16th. Thank you all for being here and we'd like to start by showing you a teaser for the film festival and we'll start with the session after. Hi, everyone. Um, hi, Ashish and Geeta. Hope we are all audible to you. Good to see you online. Um, we, um, yeah, so we, we thought that we'll begin the session by me uh, introducing the book uh, a little bit, some of the central themes, uh, some of the thoughts about the book in general and, and uh, essays in general. Um, yeah. The book, please. <laughs> um, we don't have a stall here. No? No. Okay. Can you hold mic? Yeah. Not move it around. Okay. Um, that's going to be a very difficult task to like, sit like this and not move the mic. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll. Uh, is it better if I stood there? Is the mic more stable if I stood there? No. There's no other mic there. There is, but this is good. Okay. Okay. So, um, so I'll introduce the book uh, for about roughly five to seven minutes, and then invite Rashmi to speak uh, about the book, the process of editing, compiling, um, and so on. And then uh, we'll move on to both Gita and uh, Paromita on their own essays, but also their larger reflections on the themes that arise in the book. And I'm hoping that Ashish would not hesitate joining the conversation at some point. Um, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, so, although I have a couple of, uh, I couldn't help 
uh, you know, noting down a few questions for you as well, Ashish. All right, so, um, so the book has um, all of you who have, uh, you know, taken time to take a glance at the online description or had access to a copy would have uh, recognized is a, is a kind of, you know, uh, very broad ranging um, kind of uh, conversation around the format of video um, and what is happening after the video. Um, it's, it's also about the post celluloid uh, moment uh, in the history of the in India. Um, so what are the, and I have a small note to kind of share with you, what are the political and ethical economies of the moving image post video, the principles of its production, its often threatened and always fluctuating materiality, its circuits of distribution and reuse. As we live our present uh, in an unfolding continuous crisis, both representation and history has acquired a renewed and contested urgency. The book in particular, and the series from Thulika edited by Ashish Adhyaksha, responds to this urgency. The 21 essays in the volume is assembled around broad themes. As you can see, um, the book is now being circulated. Remembrance and forgetting, artist as citizen, post-cinematic flows, and yet it is not limited to one or the other question. Together, they offer a long arc of relations that situate the video format and the moving image in these overarching social and political relations. The anthology speaks to the many shifts in moving image ecology as both Ashish and Rashmi elegantly maps for the readers. Shifts such as the celluloid to digital, new modes of exhibition and circulation, and new forms of both media and politics. The capacities of the internet have enabled sharing and archiving in an unprecedented fashion. Yet, at one and the same time, these facilities institute a globally dispersed reinforcement and recalibration of power, turning memory and knowledge into commodified and copyrighted goods. Questions such as which images of struggle have been created, bought, sold, repurposed, denounced and expunged in these milieu achieves more, you know, what, which, what achieves more prominence are some of the questions that, you know, the, the book engages with. These are some of the crucial questions that encircle this anthology. This archive comes into being in formats as diverse as digital repositories looked after by activists, found footage art documentaries, soft porn films, amateur manpoom videos to Maoist propaganda music videos. The book then examines um, which forces, local, regional, and international, public, commercial, and informal, determine the politics, economics, and aesthetics of what materials we can access and what gets erased. This volume purposefully congregates activists, artists, filmmakers, and scholars. The diversity of approaches stands collectively as commitment to the necessity for multivalence and creativity in praxis. The first section on remembering and forgetting has five essays by Rax Media Collective on the pleasures and perils of living and working in the contemporary. R.V. Ramani, uh, documentary practitioners, reflection on the material and perspectival ruins of a raging sea during the tsunami uh, in his camera. Sudhir Mahadevan on the changes of writing the history of an, challenges of writing the history of an old machine. Shubhaji Chatterjee on the low bro cinema and the economy of desire in Calcutta. And Darshana Sridharan on duration and memory of celluloid porn across different sites of the theater, the, the circulating videos, and so on. And also an illuminating conversation between Kaushik Bhaumik and the Desire Machine Collective, which explores the relation between the borders and the periphery and the film imaginary uh, in relation to all of this. Um, along these essays, what I read and what I 
discern is a dislocated historiography that emerges as new angles of vision to counter rational, linear, positivist progression of history, and an approach consistent with an emerging eruptive and transformative view of historical reality, um, say like a montage. Uh, and among mm -hmm. its main tenets, uh, tenets at and intimately tied to the intervention of the camera into everyday life is a notion of truth that is achieved via the apparatus through its conquest and collapse of space and time and its visual linkage between bodies. The next section, titled Artist as Citizen, has eminent art historian Geeta Kapoor's broad mapping of criticality in the continuing explosive conditions of post-coloniality. Nan Nancy Adania's um, essay on Sheba Chachi's radical immersive art practices. Um, the All Women uh, Collective, the influential media storm collectives, reflections on the challenges of practice in volatile Hindutva times. Uh, Nalini Malani on the particularity of the form of animation in responding to the contemporary. And Paramita Vora's deeply self-reflective essay on the first person narrative in the long trajectory of Indian documentary practice. When various artistic practices, which are not part of the officially sanctioned um, history, historical memory, proliferate, they help to engender new archives that are anomic or imaginary. The archives rearticulate memory and political power in a new modality, one that accounts for exorcised images and narratives in a new, unregulated system of legitimation. From an assembly of machine history, bodies, and practice, the volume then segues to the post-cinematic flows. While the term post-cinematic flow signifies shifts in technology, circulation, and exhibition explode in its density in Lawrence Liang's essay, <clears throat> the essays in the section speaks to concerns that are about publics and the public domain. Both Madhuja Mukherjee and S.V. Srinivas's essays brings to life the multiple balances of video in contexts as wide as the Manbhum region of Bengal to Maoist politics in Telangana. Srinivas also deftly establishes an intricate web of relations emerging between former Maoist media to mass politics of contemporary Telangana movement. Geeta Patel's essay on Deepa Mehta's fire locates the film beyond the immediacy of the text in a speculative regime of insurance, finance capital, and emergent right-wing politics. A very prescient essay, as I, as, I know, as I would like to note later and return to both Gita's and uh, Paramita's um, essays for more conversation. Um, through Shah Rukh Khan's star discourse, Ashish Raji Adhyaksha um, offers a very complex examination of the interpolating ability of cinema and Indian cinema's unique positioning at the cusp of narrative, apparatus, and citizenship. And I quote from the essay, the march of cinematic action is in Khan's work being virtually driven by a need for narrative exegesis that the traditional apparatus of celluloid simply finds insufficient. Uh, and, I, and I wanted to cite this, particularly in the context of Patan, that now that um, Shah Rukh Khan has prosthetic wings and he's flying like a, a superhero, um, and much has happened, between this quote and the time the film has emerged, uh, OTT has shifted you know, regimes of representation, new uh, genres have come up uh, in OTT, and we know that the first superhero film is not a Hindi film, uh, but a Malayalam film called Minnal Murali. So, so much have happened, and I would really like you know, Ashish's uh, thought on this, if he chooses to uh, respond. Um, <clears throat> So the, the last section, I think, uh, is something which is, you know, which is a, which is a great uh, conclusion leading to what Patricia Simmerman uh, names these emerging spaces as public domains. She reformulates the term public domain uh, from one of juridical or proprietary connotations to one that is more plural and beyond an exclusive focus on the fixity of the image and the artifact. Public domain in this expropriated mode removes chiefly, um, revolves chiefly around the concept and practice of a heterogeneity that activates new ways of thinking, acting, and connecting with others. In other words, a space that allows for the creation of new publics. As Liang's essay gestures, the fluidity of the filmic material, the omnipotence of hidden surveillance cameras, explicates 
these modes very strongly. Apart from these explicit themes, which is, uh, you know, which is uh, the way in which the book is organized and what I kind of flagged, a central question that emerges across the essays, the documents uh, reproduced in the uh, book, and the images is the experience of the body. The presence of the body allows for a counter archive of experiences, uh, an intersubjective intertextual quilt of material, um, a visual document that is viscerally engaging in its subjective intensity. The presence of the body also lends vitality and individuation to the visual historiography that is offered uh, in the book. This location of the complexity of the historical moment in and among the subjects of documentaries and these images grounds the paradoxes of historiography and competing claims projecting them on the body. Uh, and I think that emerges very powerfully in the way in which the book, it's, the whole book is conceived. This anthology, I would also say, is itself an archive. Uh, as is ever the case, it is an incomplete, expanded, and transmogrified compilation and a record of an even of, of events from the past. And I'm sure that, uh, you know, mm -hmm. more than anyone, Rashmi would agree to this. Um, mm -hmm. It's, a, and as an archive, it works against a linear sequence running from a definite past to a predictable future. So um, these are some of my thoughts on, you know, some very, very complex ideas emerging uh, in the book. Um, if I have made it, you know, sound uh, very, uh, you know, inaccessible, I'm sorry for that, but the book is not. The book is actually, there are, there are many essays in the book which are, uh, you know, uh, which are most of the essays are written in highly accessible, uh, uh, you know, style. Um, and there are uh, important documents to examine uh, in, the, in the book. The images, each of the images, as we were just discussing before we entered this conversation, they merit a separate virtual uh, curation. They, has the, they have the potential to be uh, another curated exhibition in, in itself. Uh, so there is the richness of the images. There is a richness of a historical archive. There are documents that we have not observed, but which are like, for example, the small quote from Said Mirza uh, at a particular mm. juncture of, uh, you know, uh, documentary practice, um, thinking about the relation between documentary practice and the state. Um, there are several other, there are interviews with, uh, you know, artist collectives, um, uh, writing by, um, you know, Amit Gangar on um, Cinema Prayoga. So there are um, artist collectives, practices, uh, and many of these uh, themes emerge in uh, multiple ways in the text. They are not just essays. It's a, this, this compilation is more than an essay. As I said, I also want to think of it as, a, as an archive, which is not finished as an archive, which is growing. So thanks, uh, and, and Rashmi, uh, Thank you, Bindu. I uh, couldn't have asked for anybody to put it more eloquently. Uh, she's done such a wonderful job of giving an overview of uh, the book that uh, I'm actually now pleasantly surprised at what has been pulled off. Uh, so uh, I want to thank IHS, City Scripts, Urban Lens. Um, it's wonderful to be at this venue. I've been a frequent visitor here on various occasions, and I feel uh, particularly happy that the Bangalore launch of the book is taking place at IHS, um, you know, in the context of the upcoming Urban Lens. Couldn't have asked for a better, more appropriate um, venue and audience. So uh, thank you to all of you. I have, we've passed copies of the two copies there, so I hope uh, all of you have an opportunity to at least browse through it quickly. Uh, I do want to add to what uh, Bindu said, and uh, Gita, wonderful to see you. Thank you for waking up so early and joining us on Zoom from the US. And Ashish, hello, uh, good to see you. Uh, Ashish Rajadaksha, I'd like to introduce him. He's the editor of the series, and the series is called uh, India Since the 1990s, published by Tulika. This is volume three that you're seeing, but I have volume one and two here. The first, which uh, Ashish has edited, is called The Hunger of the Republic, uh, and is a terrific collection uh, of essays, uh, very, very seminal essays by uh, economists, political theorists, uh, philosophers, etc. Uh, the second one is called uh, Improvised Futures, 
uh, Encountering the Body in Performance. This is edited by Ranjana Dave, who's a, a, a practicing dancer, and she also runs a space in Delhi for contemporary dance practice. And the third one is The Vanishing Point, which is on uh, film and video. Uh, there are three more volumes uh, which are yet to be published in the series. The next one is on photography, which is being edited by Rahab Alana. Uh, another one um, on urban studies, uh, urban landscapes, I, I suppose one I would term it that way, uh, being edited by uh, Solomon Benjamin. And uh, the final one on museums and archives being edited by uh, Professor Kavita Singh. So all of these uh, six volumes put together, and I must uh, congratulate Ashish on this you know, really ambitious uh, and um, ambitious foresight and vision uh, to think of looking back at the cultural history of India over the last 30, 40 years across these various forms. Uh, and as you know, every new volume gets published, it becomes more and more evident that uh, put together, we get a very different understanding and view of what we've been witnessing over the last few decades. Um, so I must say that you know it was uh, uh, very exciting to work on the volume, but of course it was particularly challenging because all the work happened during COVID. And Gauri Nagpal, who's the book designer of all three volumes, who was an urban lens, not urban lens, urban huh? Fe fellow, yeah, fellow here at IHS, uh, and has also done exciting, amazing work, and is now pursuing her masters. Uh, and she was also a student at Trishti. So uh, she's, she's kind of done this remarkable job of a very, very um, you know, uh, experimental book design uh, across all the three volumes. And I want to speak a little bit about the design process, because it is a book, uh, but it's really not, as Bindu suggests, it's not really a finished, conclusive argument of any kind as books, or particularly academic books, tend to like to offer. Uh, it is very much, um, you know, uh, uh, all kinds of various materials, documents, images, histories, uh, contexts that have been brought together to uh, jostle against each other. So, so they're bound by a hard copy. Uh, but really, in some sense, there is a free-flowing uh, sense of exploration, at least as in the way that I saw the process of putting the book together. So some of the most fun parts and the most challenging parts, and Bindu spoken about the essay, so I'm not going to talk about the text, but if you, uh, when you get to hold a copy of the book, if you go to the um, back cover, you will see that all the contributing uh, authors have been credited along with filmmakers and artists. So. Uh, uh, we have 53 contributors who have made this book happen. And um, if, even if you've used one single frame from a film, uh, the, the, uh, the artist has been credited as an equal contributor as an author who has written an essay of six or 7,000 words. Uh, and the point I really want to emphasize is that the images are playing a very important part in the book. Uh, they're not there to serve an illustrative purpose. Uh, at all. So no image has been used as an illustrative image, uh, but they really come with their own weight and history and their own uh, criticality. So, uh, so that was very important for me as the editor of a volume on film and video to, to recognize and acknowledge that the work that images themselves do. So just to give you two examples, since we have Paramita and Gita uh, joining us and Ashish, uh, all three are uh, uh, have have texts in the volume. Uh, for Paramita's essay on the first person in documentary, we've used um, artwork by an uh, artist, uh, Afra Shafiq, who is an interactive, uh, who, who works with interactive media. And we've used uh, images from a particular work that she did called Sultana's Reality, which of course makes reference to the 1905 uh, Urdu science fiction uh, called uh, uh, Sultana's dream, and she uh, worked in the uh, women, uh, gen, uh, gender studies archive in Calcutta and worked on women in the 19th century and what has popularly come to be known as the women's question, vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, you know, how much should they be educated, should they be let out of the house or not, what should they wear, etc., etc. And she's created a very fun interactive um, website or um, I don't know, I suppose I would call it website for the time being. And we've used images from that because uh, Afra, like Paromita, uh, is very particular about 
the voice that she uses in the narration of these various histories and stories. And we, uh, we thought uh, that you know there was something uh, which was both complementary but coming from a point of difference um, in the way in which both filmmakers, artists are thinking about the first person narrative in the context of collective past histories. Um, you know, and this relationship between I speaking but on behalf of something, I suppose, which is perhaps not always fixed, uh, but exists in some sense. Uh, for Gita's essay, a very shortened essay uh, from her book, uh, which contains a much longer chapter, her essay is on fire, Deepa Mehta's film, and um, uh, you know um, they will talk about it uh, themselves more. But I just want to say that while we were trying to find images of the many protests that had taken place in India in the 90s, where theatres were burned down and all of that, there were very few good media images available. So it was as if an entire history had disappeared from the internet. Right? And, and then one started wondering about, you know, every newspaper had reported this regularly, but when we look back at a history which is not that old now, uh, you can't find any uh, visual archive, any visual references. And that was a real challenge, and then uh, one discovered that there is something known as digital archaeology, where there is d a digital debris that moves to the bottom of what is searchable and what can be discovered, and of course, comes with its own politics in terms of what generations, younger generations, looking at the past 20, 30 years later are going to be able to find uh, and exposes all the vulnerabilities of digital space, which we feel, you know, we tend to imagine is uh, so generous and so accessible and so affluent and all of that, right? But that's not the case at all. So we had to construct images. And uh, an artist called Sultana Zana actually, you know, tried to play around with things and she's mm -hmm. taken some images and there was there were discussions on there's one hand if you see uh, Gita's essay there one hand with bangles and a wedding ring mm -hmm. holding strips of images so it was also there was lots of discussion around is this a heterosexual relationship mm -hmm. is it a married mm -hmm. person what should the hand look like so what I'm saying is that there was a lot of thought that went into actually the construction and selection and the editing of the images, because uh, none of the mm. images, or very few images, have been used in their original form. And I have to acknowledge the great generosity of artists, filmmakers, and of course the authors, whose texts also we have edited quite uh, extensively, in allowing us to do that. Because one can be precious about one's own work, right? But to our great fortune, uh, we ended up working with people who are very, very generous. So um, I think that has been really the exciting part of putting the book together. And as you will see, there are excerpts from judgments on censorship, uh, one of Anand Patwardhan's films. There are scenes from Chaitanya Tamane's film Court. And there is a lot of variety of material that is kind of brought to be in conversation with each other. So at, at, at least I would hope that readers of the book would see it not as a book as text, but something that you know one can go through back and forth and make connections across the sections because huge connections emerge even across the three sections, which Bindu has of course very wonderfully spelled out. Uh, maybe in a bit we can show some images later, but you want to um, yeah, go on to do. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, so um, so to Paromita. <laughs> So I'm not particularly asking any any questions, but uh, for the audience, maybe I can just uh, quickly, you know, summarize what is uh, Paramita's essay about. It's a it's a very deeply self-reflective essay. Um, yeah, but at the same time, it's also a <clears throat> it's probably one of a kind of you know uh, piece on the history of the first-person narrative in Indian documentary. Uh, and and, and uh, when she does that, she actually traces it back to the institutional site of the films division documentary practice and, uh, you know, practitioners like S. N. Shastri to, uh, to various other works and also her own practice, right? So, and what she, also in that process, what she does is to kind of explain its, you know, its, its 
very proliferating kind of semiotics. Uh, and also, the, and there is an emphasis on the mutability of that I. It's not as if that I is fixed by somebody and that, will, that is inherited mm -hmm. in documentary practice. It's also about how the I is invented. And most interestingly, um, what uh, Paramita also shows is that the relation between the I and the we. Right? Or in other words, she actually, uh, if you will allow me to use that word, she's actually saying that it's a singular, it's always a singular plural, right? She's not saying that this is, this, it's, it's always an I. She's saying that that, that relation between the I and the we uh, and the I in the documentary practice is a singular plural. And that, I think, is a really eliminating insight into, into uh, practice. But most interestingly, if people have followed uh, Paromita's work, especially her web-based work, uh, which is the last decade, say, last five to six years work, we'll also realize that she is drawing quite a bit from, um, you know, vernacular uh, practices of music, mm -hmm. of image making, um, performance, etc. in her work very actively, right? I mean, I have consistently used her videos in, uh, to, to talk about many things from consent to many other questions in uh, my class mm -hmm. where I teach media theory. So uh, the, the consent, uh, the Tamasha videos um, are the ones which I consistently mm -hmm. use when even in orientations, right? The orientation to students about, uh, you know, these questions. So, um, so she, uh, you know, um, that one doesn't speak without the other is something which she emphasizes mm -hmm. in the essay. And also explains the modes through which she draws from vernacular practices of speaking, the, the ones which I just explained. The trickster is the example that she uses in the essay. So, um, so it's very evident in the essay that the first person narrative have persisted across the video format into new media forms. That's, that's what is strongly emerging there. Um, also, the other thing which he actually emphasizes, which is quite, I think, again, uh, a very deeply insightful observation, is that the, you know, is, is film viewing itself as a very ritual practice. And what has happened to that ritual practice when, uh, you know, it moves to more personalized viewing? And what does the, the first person narrative uh, become when it shifts from this uh, new modes of, you know, personal, uh, viewing experience. What does it? Uh, what does it happen? What what mutates in that space is something which he asks. So I'm I'm kind of, you know. Um, so it it would be really nice for Paramita to kind of explain some of these through her own examples. But also something which I want to pose is that. Uh, you know, how do you understand the moving image itself, right? It's a, I use the term recalcitrance, uh, which is also to, to kind of indicate that it's an undying thing, right? It's, a, uh, it's something which is still existing across all of this. Um, these multitudes uh, that you already address in the essay, is that a, how, how are you thinking about these? Right. I'm, I'm not sure that I can exactly address... Uh, that last part of your question, I mean, maybe in some oblique fashion, maybe not directly, right? But I think that the interesting thing about the documentary form is that it's a kind of magpie form, right? Actually, it takes what it sees and finds attractive out there in the world and then constructs something from it. And I, I think that uh, personally for me, in the work that I did, I never found, even from my first film, my first film I made in 1995, Annapurna, so that... Uh, and it was about a small women's collective, well, not small. It was about a women's co credit cooperative. And of course, the story is that, you know, there is a founder. There's always a story of how there's a founder, and then she organized the women and brought them together. But actually, when I met the people, I thought, like, there were three or four really exciting people who happened to have been friends or comrades, as you would like to put it, who helped the organization to start. And when each of them tells the story of how the organization began, it's a little bit different but it's not divergent, right? So this idea of a polarity, that different versions will never have anything in common. That's not really how it happens. So I remember in that time, at a very young age, in a very simplistic way almost, that I told the story of the origin of the organization by cutting between the varied narratives, right? So I think like for me, it was always interesting, this kind of magpie-ness of what, what is uh, attractive about this reality outside. 
and i think from there you you know you it feels natural to uh, think about how performers also like the bahurupya whom i refer to uh, the bahurupya being a form that happens within reality mm -hmm. which is it's performed within reality and what does it really do and i think to think about a film in the same way that when a film is being played it is being performed actually and i think that in some senses bollywood films are so much more co popular mainstream cinema is much more conscious of that idea of the film is a performance but the documentary obscures that it pretends it is not a performance whereas i would say that if one thinks of each film as a person and when i'm talking about the first person i'm saying the film is the person actually the film is the construction and if one were to think about say like say anand's films for me are very compelling as a performance of passion even if i may uh, critique a film because of things i like or don't agree with or whatever but i feel like there is a lot of impact of a film in the way that it is performed and so i think that uh, for me the interestingness about the moving image is that it is moving amongst people and that people then move into it or in relationship to it of course as we as, as we see in the media today um i think while making unlimited girls of course i was able to because unlimited girls comes at that moment of digitality but it also comes 10 years after globalization so when many of these things that we talk about as being very unitary are no longer so right like what does it mean to be a political person what is the meaning of politics who gets to talk about politics and what are you going to actually feel vis-a-vis -vis the moving image what is your own to use a word i hate to use agency vis-a-vis -vis the moving image right and the idea that in a in a an entertainment film you lose all agency that's why the entertainment film is bad because you become so swept up in the passion of it that it whatever you feel about it is no longer meaningless whereas in the documentary there is this desire to create a critical distance but you are as swept up maybe or not so i think like i was very keen to look at how the moving image allows you to be swept up and but swept and and to privilege that sweeping up like how can you make very very sensory moving images that sweep up the person and make them part of the moving image and how can you make the film so open ended that while you are strongly asserting what you think the audience may go away with a completely different thing right so i think like that was my interest in it and i just want to i mean i don't want to take up too much time but two things that i find have been very for me a journey that then it became a natural progression that already unlimited girls is doing what annapurna did like 100x because there are all these feminists in the chat room but they are not in opposition they are all in a kind of polyphony uh there are many many types of things in unlimited girls which are not traditionally to be found in a feminist film right so that altering what is what is the supposed to be of that image and finally i made this series called connected hum tum for television and that was interesting because it was five women filming their own lives uh and sending us the footage and us editing that footage into reality come soap opera type of formats right and for television so i think that in itself is interesting because it detached me the director from the creation of the moving image and it uh, put me in a very precarious place where i have to believe somebody else's rendition of that moving image right so i think that was a reversal of how we interact via the moving image the subject and the director uh it exposes the tensions it exposes uh, uh the intrigue <laughs> in how films are made actually and i think from there agents of fish became like i think of agents of fish as a moving image even though maybe it's not traditional to be seen as a film but i think of it as an unending film which many people are making at the same time which is actually what the digital universe offers us at its best right that actually we have no idea who will send what narrative when it will just arrive one day in our inbox and then we will engage with that narrative and we will make it part of this whole thing which has a certain which has a certain unitariness which is very affective but which is full of many voices so i think yes the moving image allows and a kind of rem it it makes visible this idea of the self and the other and the self as part the self and the other as part of each other not as two opposite things so i don't know if i answered your question but and you also hinted at the ways in which uh, you know the moving image is now collected for each it's not it's not just made in the conventional traditional manner so that's that's really that really is is a insightful answer to question um in, in um, you know listen to geeta um hi geeta hi Oh, you can hear me uh, am I, I? Yeah, I can hear you perfectly although you 
Everybody's <laughs> going in and out. Um, right. Okay. So go ahead. So I'll I'll try to uh, make my question very short. Um, so Geeta's essay, uh, if uh, all of you have taken a look at the book, and then you have a. Uh, good sense of you know what what is the book like so geeta's essay is an abridged version uh, of uh, as as rashmi explained a larger um, essay um and um, you know it it uh, uh, in many ways it's actually a very uh, you know it's 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 moving between uh, different times and making some things uh, visible to us as i as i think about it as i think about someone who has uh, you know many of us who have experienced 1995 and fire uh, and living in a neoliberalized in neoliberalizing india um new censorship regimes and conversations around fire and so on um what the essay does is to lay bare the spurious you know um acts of uh, speculation um which particularly in the domains of economics uh and also techno science and ultimately which structured new social relations and was generative of uh political formations that uh, we live now and also uh, formation of different kind of publics um so what uh, geeta arranges for us to see in that essay um is both a uh, dystopian and an apocalyptic present that we are currently residing in you know right in 19 uh, while writing about 1995 um so i have i have one question to pose to geeta which is um that uh, now that we live in a risky regime which is premised on a very speculative futurity um in which the promise of technological progress economic growth etc um and also a prolongation of the status quo is sort of very made very important um and we also live in a media ecology which has turned more and more speculative uh we have also uh, you know we live also live in a media ecology where the older uh, ideals of of public service etc is relinquished my question to her is that how does she see the these current speculative regimes as as interlaced with each other um and also think about the 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 future right but i also have another uh, kind of question for geeta which is also drawing upon her you know larger body of work which is that although i i my first question is something which is framing this as kind of an economic argument <laughs> i feel that in the in the course of the uh, discussion that we had online and also your other works that what you are also suggesting what's what's your what you kind of established in the essay in the book and your other works is an aesthetic complex actually you're not really talking mm-hmm. only about a mm-hmm. uh, you know speculative regime it's also an aesthetic mm-hmm. complex that you are mm-hmm. uh, visibilizing for us and in that mm-hmm. uh, an aesthetic complex which is also in um also with a special affordance for mapping very epochal transitions in the indian subcontinent such as the mm-hmm. transition to neoliberal capitalism and also mm-hmm. that very anguished move through the last decades to a hindutva regime right so uh, would it be right to think about your you know the your formulation as an aesthetic complex rather than a Uh, mm-hmm. a very only a uh, speculative financial kind of one is one question second is that from there uh, you know since you have been quite prescient about uh, you know making these connections how do you sort of envisage radical futures in this you don't have to answer mm-hmm. that it's just a, a straight thought mm-hmm. right okay so i wanted to first thank all of you i um urban lands ihs rashmi sunil bindu and paramita uh, paramita um uh, and subhashi and ashish maybe for responding for being here and the audience and i i wanted to i just want to say um having held i want to say a couple of just to start with a couple of words about the book because it's really uh bindu really had her finger on it it's it's it is a book that is like literally the physical embodiment of 
speculative video making. And it's, um, you know, I think it's, it's a, it's, it's really interesting because as Pyro was talking and our exchanges on the internet, what I realized is the book itself was like something Pyro might have, Pyro Mita might have made, right? It's montaged, it allegorizes, it juxtaposes, you feel you're moving across sonic and haptic cues. I mean, literally, it's, um, it's capricious. It's a, that's a word Pyro uses in her essay. And it's a kind of capriciousness that I think invites to go to sort of come to your question at the end, invites that kind of possible, maybe possible future. I mean, I think that, um, you know, Paro actually, in what she talked about through her practice, can give us something that we can think about as a way in which we might imagine a future. Um, and the, the other, I just wanted to talk, I mean, I, the thing that you saw, Bindu, and I think that Rashmi knows about my work, um, and it's, this is why it's so, it's wonderful to, to have me and Paro Mitha together, is that I think about this essay as a speculative history of the present. And I think of it as a political intervention. I write nothing that is not. And I think what's remarkable about Rashmi's editing down of my essay is that she keeps the formal features as of the essay. So it's not just that I think about an aesthetic complex. In everything I write, I make an aesthetic complex. So Rashmi actually played around with the formal features, played through them, so that what I was trying to do through the form the essay takes comes through so clearly. And that's what you noticed, I think, Bindu, as it's a, it's a visual cinematic form that you would notice right away. It um, theatricalizes, storyboards its frames and scenes, summons you to live in them sonically and visually. And I, it's really interesting. I write, I'm not a linear thinker, so I, I, I write in multiple dimensions and I write to be read aloud. So, you know, it's part of my writing itself works if you actually read uh, the visual aloud and feel it on your skin so the essay itself becomes a form of speculative non-fiction and moving text and i think what i was trying to do in the way that paramita does in her documentaries um is sort of evade the form to which we succumb as we write essays or papers that lend themselves to our investment in knowing more knowing better knowing properly um so i've written it this particular um, chapter, the what the chapter that uh, Rashmi took and holds on to as a series of montaged events that take place at particular dates. I compact time by having one day follow another in quick succession, or expand time by leaving the date open, repeating days such as December the third to imagine events over a longer duration and space. Um, and it, what it asks you to do is sort of engage with the essay, not just through what we feel we do, which is through epistophilia, knowing, wanting to know more, but actually what Paro has us do with her work, which is actually, and which is thinking about in terms of the documentary, to really think of the essay more as one, the essay form itself that invites you to feel, that actually urges you to feel. Um, so the and partly I think this essay works in many different places in the collection because it, as um, you know, Rashmi said, it actually becomes a, a speculative bits and pieces archive of times, events, places, um, that and the stories, some of which I started recording in the period. So those that that record lives leaves traces in the chapter. And they disappear, disappeared, as Rashmi points out, from view elsewhere. So it, and it offers, I wanted to offer the future we now live with. So um, one of the, you know, one of the things I wanted to think about, which Bindu raised, was this word that was being bandied about at the time at which I began collecting, really writing and thinking and collecting the, the speculative history of that present. And it was neoliberalism, right? 
And there was sort of lots of stuff on neoliberalism, but no content. I mean, there was sort of a kind of empty form. And the empty form for me is really interesting to sort of think through because it's part of what I'm thinking about that has happened politically. Um, so it's, and that what I wanted to, partly because I was, I've been teaching film since the late 1980s with practitioners. So I actually have been teaching um sort of thinking how one thinks about film since the 80s with people who are making documentaries and fiction film, but also thinking with practitioners. And, and you know, sort of the what um, Rashmi lays out, sort of the relationship that I'm, what I'm trying to move away from the essay is to move away from spectator, audience, fan to a, a, an understanding of the idea of multiple publics. And... What I was interested in at the time was how how particular publics actually found literally what they how they were constituted like how did how did you respond as a uh, as publics you know in how did people come together as a collective to think through mediated images. Um, whether they were, and actually one of the things I was tracking at the time in the 1990s was mediated images on the net. So websites, um, a kind of nascent social media, nascent social media presences, and actually thinking about the idea of the publics coalescing not just in the territoriality of the nation state, but outside the territoriality of the nation state and thinking about publics as living in a state of constant nostalgia, right? So how did that then come together with a sense, uh, with, with neoliberalism and as constituting publics that had a relationship to, um, to you know, themselves and to something that, was, that I was really interested in. So what I was interested in was how did publics get constituted as responding to something that actually never existed? So I was interested in publics that responded to an event that they never attended. So movies they never went to, uh, you know, uh, images that they'd never seen. Um, and, you know, how they came together with publics that actually had seen an event. So what I realized because uh, two things were going on around the question of the protection of cultural property, right? Uh, simultaneously in the 1990s. And this, what uh, Rashmi talks about, and she makes very clear in my essay, and one of them was the idea of ensuring oneself, like literally self-protection. So there's the idea of self-protection, but not a, but this sort of relationship between the, the I and the we, that's constituted through a notion of speculative risk. So the, the, the I is risk pooled together. So the public actually becomes something that shares risks rather than sharing, a, you know, sort of a watching space, right? And those risks are something that actually it's, and this is the interesting thing about insurance, is you begin to find, look for, and fight for and imagine protections for something that never existed, right? So this, this is the thing that's, that's, I think, important to think about. How do you actually imagine a past that never existed and on that base a sense of collective losses that never happened for a past that never existed? And how does one think of publics constituted that way in, 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 in keys that don't return? Because one of the things that happens is when people respond, we often go to bad faith, right? Uh, a misapprehension. And I wanted to actually think about political responses to mediated events that have come to be so ordinary that groups coalesce about them or, and around them that don't just like fall into some notion of bad faith. Um, 
you know, so I wanted to think through risk as a techno apparatus through which one imagines one's life individually, but also as a collective. You come together through what you understand as shared risks, not shared pleasure or danger, but through risk, lived in constant risk of loss, of losing something you feel you ought to have that you never had and losing a past that you never had that you imagined you ought to have had. Um, and, the, you know, so, and part of what you're doing in that collection is actually producing a culturally, as you know, to paraphrase Rus Rushby, talking about my essay, a culturally immutable nation state, which you, which was to protect you and in its turn, because you protected a culturally coherent, fictive form. So, you know, and I think what's interesting is this really came up, I mean, something happened in the 1990s. Some, you know, that this, this, the, the books in the series sort of address. Um, and that was a kind of proliferation. And that proliferation has now become quotidian to sort of go to what Bindu was asking us about. And what's quotidian, I think, is a kind of like, and I'm just, I'm going to throw a bunch of things out because I think we have to, our response, because responses are risk pooled, because responses are made through a relationship between an I and a we, the only way one can have a response that has any political efficacy is to have them collectively. So I can't propose something. I can just suggest you know, tugs that pull us in a certain direction. I can suggest a kind of tugs that for me are speculative. And I was thinking, you know, I mean, I was thinking about the, I sent um, all of us this impossible essay I wrote in a response to, to think about what was happening from the 1990s to a sort of, to, to the, you know, 2016 and it's a diff still a different period now. But I mean, what I said in my, you know, sort of the request to write a present for the 20 for 2016 and in the similar way to what to the kind of question Bindu asked me is I wanted to think about what finance for all as a possibility that's being thrown out. Right. Um, buy now, pay later schemes, which actually was is the name of an essay I wrote um, in the early uh, uh, 2000s. Um, you know, you live a kind of, and the idea of a finance app life. I want to think about the way in which a kind of entrepreneurial alchemical citizenship with makeover as a constant possibility works in constant, in concert with, and sometimes in opposition to a risk pooled, anxiety fueled, techno intimate citizenship. I want to think about how we've actually. We are in uh, a moment, and I've been reading essays sort of written from Thailand, written from different places, on a kind of prophylactic panacea nationalism, and we can talk about this, a precautionary preventative nationalism. And ironically, um, this actually came out of the U.S. anti-terrorism, glo the globalization of U.S. anti-terrorism uh, nationalisms. Um, you know, sort of in a sense that this sort of precautionary preventative form activates a kind of wellness regime through which you can make yourself over in a kind in a, in a kind of fiscal alchemy. And if you if you buy a finance app, you have to pay back. And the question is, but you hold that paying back literally you hold off paying back for a really long time. So citizenship is predicated on futures produced as the possibilities for conditions in which one can make oneself over. So what kind of citizenship is that? Um, what does it mean that we have a kind of politics and publics vested in these, in these, in this sort of citizenship? What does that mean in terms of living a kind of present where violence is quotidian, right? How do we, how do we actually imagine um, 
a future? How do we imagine a future? I mean, when I first wrote my response, what I wanted us to do is to think about justice, salvageable lives, sustainable futures. But many of those have gone by the wayside. So how can we activate it? How can we do it in a way that this book suggests in its form, in its formal features? And in Farah talked about, um, Rashmi and Bindus talked about, where we are not sort of, we can't actually put ourselves in the conventional documentary, right? That's what, I mean, literally you cannot um, produce a future through that in, in any simple way. That's not, that's a kind of speculative form that I think is, has never been open to us. So I ask you all, uh, how do we do it? I hope that made sense. And I, you know, it is early for me. I got up very early this morning, so I'm in a ramble state. Thanks, Gita. We'll, we'll get back to you <laughs> very soon with more questions. No, I, um, so I think that it's time then that, you know, to go back to Paramita and just, you know, <laughs> ask you to speak on some of the themes that are emerging in the book as you, as you read them. Hmm. Or bodies, the way they emerge, as we kind of saw in the, all of us gestured toward that. Uh, publics. Uh, it was wonderful to listen to Geeta, actually. Uh, and I was thinking also uh, in, res in uh, I was also, as she was speaking, thinking about the way that people, uh, especially elite young people, tell the story of their lives in, uh, as mm -hmm. having a past trauma, which determines mm -hmm. the makeover, not of themselves, but of the world to accommodate mm -hmm. that and how it is linked actually, like it was very enlightening for me suddenly to understand those connections between the larger political and the political personal, so to speak, right? So, so I think that this idea of, uh, I mean, I think that when it comes to history, obviously in my essay, I am responding to the fact that there is a history of documentary that we receive as practitioners of certain mm -hmm. kinds. And it's often presented to us as the only history of documentary. Mm -hmm. And I think that analogously you can say that about any history, right? That even mm -hmm. the history of feminism was received in a certain way. And for me, the dissatisfaction of the feeling unable to place myself in that history actually led me to search for a form to answer mm -hmm. Geeta's thought that how do we place ourselves in the documentary and even why. So in some senses, that idea that this history does not have what I perceive to be my history, personally, present in it, makes me want to insert myself and look for a form wherein I can insert myself more easily, right? And, and, but when I do that, if I search for such a form, that I think compels me uh, to allow others to insert themselves as well. It is actually not really possible to open up that for those seams and insert yourself and not allow more insertions to happen, right? Which I think of as a kind of promiscuity. Mm -hmm. Like, and an mm -hmm. idea that I'm very interested in is this idea of the fleeting intimacy, which is very, according to me, related to urban life, especially Bombay. Like, I should say I think of myself as a regional filmmaker. I think of myself as mm -hmm. a very Bombay filmmaker. My work is very influenced by that kind mm -hmm. of Bombay, you know, argot in a sense. Mm -hmm. So I think that mm -hmm. the idea that you can be in the train and you can be crying, mm -hmm. And everybody mm -hmm. is watching you cry, but leaving you alone. And these very mm -hmm. public privacies that Bombay offers you, right? I'm very interested mm -hmm. in that fleeting intimacy. Uh, and mm -hmm. th that fleeting intimacy in an urbane sense actually mm -hmm. allows the entry point, entry of everybody mm -hmm. into a very intellectual space. Because mm -hmm. if you have a conversation with the taxi driver in Bombay, there is a commentary mm -hmm. on the state of the nation, on, this, on pollution, mm -hmm. but also on personal life emotions, mm -hmm. cinema, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, to give an example, I'm sorry, I'm gonna speak anecdotally, that being my tendency, that recently I was on the phone, obviously I have been very swept up by Pathan, and I was spending a lot of time talking about the film everywhere I went. So I was talking to my friend on the phone about Pathan, I was in a very long taxi ride from downtown Bombay to Andheri where I live, 
And uh, when, so in Pathan, there is a question asked, are you Muslim? And he says, well, I, he doesn't answer the question. He said, I was abandoned in a cinema hall, right? And I said to my friend that at the moment that he said it, did you not think in your mind the question Deepika asked, which movie was playing? in that cinema hall. And I think mm -hmm. everybody asked that question in their minds and mm -hmm. everybody must have answered it differently. And I, in mm -hmm. my mind, I thought the movie that was playing then was almost definitely Vakt. Because mm -hmm. I think Pathan is like a film history film, right? In my mind. Yeah. So the cab driver, as soon as I finished my phone call, said to me, Lagta hai aap film line ke ho. I think you work in the movies, right? So I said, why do you think that? And he said, because you know, you refer to Vakt film, then you refer to Mother India film, then you refer to so-and-so film. Now, of course, that doesn't mean I'm in the film line, but actually I'm in the film line in a very different sense, right? Actually, the idea that film line in Bombay would mean a totally different thing almost, that we all, actually everybody in Bombay is in the film line to some extent, right? Because we are all performing that cinema city as Madhushri might have said, yeah. So I think that uh, I have totally, of course, gone away from your question now, but, uh, but, <laughs> but I'm just saying that actually, I feel like this idea of you receive a history and you want to break away from that history to put, find yourself, not necessarily to find a hidden history of something else. At least that's how it is for me. And I think that's what leads to certain mm -hmm. forms emerging for me because I'm searching for that idea. Uh, and of course, when I say me, I don't really mean me, like me, but some me-ness that I feel is missing from that place, right? Like, so if I see the history of Indian women in a feminist sense, and I think like, well, I want to see my uh, divorced alcoholic grandmother who was a film producer for, for, for some time, but also started a steel factory in between in Nepal. So I want to see that person, not her, mm -hmm. but that person, and I'm not seeing it. So you search for that thing. Yeah, and that, that search takes you to other places, maybe in a way what Gita's talking about, collective risk. You take the risk of stepping out of that Lakshman Rekha of what is the, uh, you know, assigned documentary at birth mm -hmm. and say that actually I will look elsewhere. So that transness, in a sense, allows you to make different histories or whatever. So similarly, I would say, you know, even um, Subhashi and I were talking about the fact that she didn't know I had taken such an interest in films division. And it's actually mm -hmm. because uh, I happened to by chance have a fleeting intimacy with SNS Shastri randomly going into a cinema at a festival and mm -hmm. seeing a film. And I was like, what is this? I didn't know it existed. And for me, I would just say that my interest in films division was essentially a crush on SNS Shastri as a filmmaker. Like I had a crush on Shastri and I just wanted to see more and more. And I think that once that feeling that crush was done for me, it infused what I did. Whatever I worked on later, one, it, it helped me to identify myself. So it's the opposite of what Gita was saying. It is a past I did not know I had, actually, mm -hmm. right? Like it was there, but nobody had told me it's there. And I'm like, oh mm -hmm. my God, like I thought to myself, I would have saved a lot of time if I had known this person existed. But the thing is, maybe I wasn't supposed to. Maybe it was all about finding this person via the route that mm -hmm. I took, right? So I think that in some senses, once that infusion of past and present had happened, it allowed me to go into a different future. So it's not that I'm interested in, I did receive an IFA grant to do history of Indian documentary. So I guiltily confess that, you know, it actually turned into this endeavor of finding these things. In fact, I have a huge collection of every article, perhaps written on Indian documentary, which I photocopied and collected, but didn't write any book about. Because somehow it was more about that love affair, that sensory relationship with this past I did not know I had, that, did not exactly birth me, but is a kind of genealogical history, which is what the essay is exploring, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not exploring it through a history, but it's exploring it through an occurrence. That wherever the I occurs, and even where it doesn't occur sometimes, I'm sort of searching for something inside that, and it's generating something for me, an indication <laughs> towards the future. <laughs> Quickly add one, just, you know, I'm just finding, uh, it's been so wonderful to listen to both of you, Gita and uh, Paro. And I'm now discovering so many things about this book, uh, which I had perhaps, you know, uh, understood in a uh, sensorial way, but not in such a um, cognitive manner. Uh, and I think uh, what you're describing is very similar to my process, my, the journey that I went through while putting this together, in the sense that it was very speculative and it was very exploratory. And one of the things that I had imagined is going to be a 
problem with the book is that it talks about documentary, it talks about visual arts, which are exhibited in galleries and museums, and it talks about popular film, and it talks about exploitation cinema, and it talks about pornography, and it just takes, as you say, promiscuously from so many different uh, you know, realms of the moving image, and the moving image then became a uh, affordable kind of space within through which one could navigate all these multiplicities because I think this is also a, I think a, a sort of you know a, a common uh, point of investment in that and it, it is a bit of a grouse uh, 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 thing that I have against film studies uh, which is that <laughs> because you are the film studies person in the room uh, Ashish is on screen so uh, is that you know we tend to keep popular cinema separate from documentary and fiction mm -hmm. and and video art and uh, and you know and then sites of exhibition and of mm -hmm. course now everything is seen on our mobile phones and uh, our laptops and all of that so I like that whole old history of spectatorship theory across these forms and uh, is really kind of needs to be re-examined and revisited and. We are all consuming so many different things all the time, right? So we're not one fixed person. Uh, and that is, mm -hmm. I think, the exciting part for me because it's almost as if you imagine that, okay, when she is watching a Shah Rukh Khan film, she's supposed to respond in this way as a spectator audience. But when she's watching a documentary. And so there are also these kind of assumptions that come into play. And I think perhaps we need newer and I hate to say this, but scientific ways of understanding how spectatorship <laughs> happens. So, yeah. Uh, the separate types of forms and how we talk about them. I always call it the real estate approach. It's like when you're in Kolaba, you will be posh. And when you're in Daisar, <laughs> you'll be different. And uh, as if to say, you are not the person actually what you're saying. Traveling. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, it's, not, it's not about where, you, where the thing is but actually what is happening inside you when you're, when you're in front of the thing. So what I wanted to say, I mean, one of the things I was thinking about as Paro and Rashi were talking is this poet I work on, who I've been working on since the 1980s, uh, Miraji. And um, one of the, Miraji wrote what he called a Namo Kamal, incomplete, unfinished self-portrait. And I was thinking, and also he did these sort of history essays. I mean, one of them is on Sappho. And he used the word shayad all the time, right? So basically, it was a speculative, as much a speculative past as a speculative future. So speculative futures were made out of speculative past, but Byron and Rashmi offered us something, I think, that is an answer to your question, Bindu, which is um, history, sort of moving away from history as hagiography um, to a kind of history as, you know, literally something, and I think Bar said it extremely well, a history I didn't know I had, right? Rather than the kind of history that produces a certain kind of publics. And the, you know, which, which is a history that never happened and must never happen. Actually, you have to hold that history open as must never happen in order to make sure that you can imagine that it did. And Paro's, and it's actually... It's, I was thinking of history as far as talking and Rashmi was talking in the way you negotiate this book as historical, as a piece of present history, as serendipity, right? The book is about the histories we didn't know we had that are met as momentary occurrences that are met as serendipitous. And so I think it's the book itself and... In some ways, Paro's work from the beginning has always invited me to think differently. I mean, I think partly, Paro, in the 1990s, I was watching your work as I was thinking about what was going on in the ground. And I'm a Mumbaiker. Like, I literally, I, I was born and bred in, in Bombay, and I'm totally... I mean, when I hang out with people from other places, I realize how truly Bombay I am. And it's literally that idea of fleetingness, right, that I'm really... Interested, interested in as like liter as a kind of occurrence that comes and goes, and it's it's not being attached in some simple way to the fleetingness that I think as and make it bigger than it is that I think will can be a place of the possible political for us. 
It's really wonderful way of framing, you know, what we are struggling with, but the question of what is the politics of the possible and the politics of the impossible. So uh, thank you for that. And then I guess we have some time for roughly 15 minutes for question and answers. Um, so yes, please feel free to shoot. Thanks. I'm going to be one of those um, terrible people who'll ask the first question, even though I should be the last one or not as ask. Thank you, actually, Rashmi, Paramita, Geeta, Bindu, and Ashish for joining. And um, I've, I must confess, I haven't read the entire book, not even half of it. But what I've read, it is a book am amongst everything else that uh, you're saying that uh, filled me with pleasure. So thank you. I have a question for you, Paramita. And I was... Um, at breakfast telling you this morning, it was for me actually quite, um, I have read uh, many of your works and I watched almost all your films, but it was a surprise for me to know that actually in 2011, uh, when you wrote this essay, uh, or when it was published, you were already thinking about uh, films division and writing about it in relationship to your work. So it was very insightful and revealing and something new uh, in the essay for me. I have a question. Because for those of you who haven't uh, read her essay, but quickly to say that her, her, her article traces the I, the I in the nonfiction film. So she looks at the films of Pramod Pati and SNS Sastri, um, and also then from that moment of the films division films, moves to what you call the independent documentary films in India, and then comes to her own work and traces journey and her own genealogy to uh, the films of FT. And what I found uh, most fascinating, apart from the fact that who is the narrator, what is the voice of the narrator, and what is the role she plays in films. And you actually use this term about how the unreliable narrator who's in your films, uh, who, for those of you who watched Paramita's films, are in Unlimited Girls, Annapurna, um, and also actually other films, that you actually are very committed to the idea of the unreliable narrator not just as the voice that provides pleasure, but also as a political act of reclaiming. And that too in non-fiction films, which we all know, of course, it has changed um, in the past 10, 11 years. Um, we look at it as, as the voice of certitude. Now, it doesn't matter if they're films division films or films that are funded by mm -hmm. um, international funding agencies. So if you could speak a little bit more about your relationship to the idea of the unreliable narrator. I think my relationship to the unreliable narrator was not actually in uh, opposition to the voice of God idea, right? I mean, in a very quick history, there is the sense that, oh, the old form of filmmaking, which didn't have a clear point of view, although of course it did, like from the nationhood point of view, all those big industrial level uh, films division or other such films were the voice of the nation, so to speak. Uh, but uh, that uh, we don't want to make a voice of God documentary. That was the thing always told to you. So by the time I started making films, the idea of having a commentary in your film was already considered sus. So the fact that I had a commentary, but that my commentary was already very hard to call commentary. Like obviously it was physically a commentary, but it was very much like quoting whatever I felt like and starting with talking about love, but then going into feminism, etc., etc. But I think that for me that I was speaking counter to, I wrote another essay about why Indian documentary filmmakers have beards. Mm -hmm. And it was a genuine question or genuine question as they say on the internet that uh, I will think like, why do so many <laughs> documentary filmmakers have beards? And so actually this idea of comportment that you present yourself as the reliable uh, witness to a truth, a historical thing that you will now tell other people about. You know, I think so. It was my my position was vis-a-vis vis vis that that I wanted to create a narrator whom, if you don't rely on the narrator, whom are you going to rely upon? Yourself, right? So actually, the idea of the film is that for you to rely less on me and more on what you feel, which means I have to leave it open to disagreement from you. And of course, like somebody may say, what is this nonsensical film you've made, etc. So leaving yourself <laughs> open to that possibility, uh, I think having characters like Annapurna, 
uh, who's the goddess of food in a film about vegetarian, non-vegetarian mm -hmm. buildings in Bombay. The thing about Annapurna is that she's likable. So again, I don't want to say the unreliable narrator is not always some kind of uh, con person. But you're extremely charmed by Annapurna. She seems to be quite a party animal. But she's also too much of a party animal. So you're just like, now should I believe what she's saying? Is this a thing I can rely upon or not? So I think that uh, the narrator is displacing the weight of uh, truth, of course, but even importance from themselves. It, it is to, to decenter yourself, but not efface yourself. I think that's what I want the unreliable narrator to do, so that you mm. become the reliable narrator of your experience of the film and what you understood from it. That, yeah, so I guess to the extent that I can be said to have a social commitment, it is to, allow, it is to somehow create a space where people have belief in their experiential truths as opposed mm -hmm. to truth somebody else gives and I feel like this the, yeah, the pleasure the fun of watching a film together make a film that is fun for people to watch not fun but engaging and involves their whole bodies and at the same time compels them to trust that pleasure <coughs> not to trust my displeasure because mostly films are about somebody being displeased with the world and then telling you that I'm very displeased with the world. Look at how much inequality there is. Please listen to my displeasure and know that that is how you must think. Vis a vis, I had, there's a lot of pleasure and we are enjoying ourselves in this film. But look, there's a lot of things in the world that maybe, you know, you could think about again. So to do it from that place of connection rather than, yeah, uh, instruction. Hello. Am I audible? Yeah. Uh, firstly, thank you so much. This has been really enriching. Uh, hello. Yeah. Better? Yeah. First, thank you so much. This has been really enriching. I have a question for Geeta, though. Uh, mm. When she talks about uh, public nostalgia of an event that never really happened, or this Can you hold the mic closer? It's hello. Yeah. Can you hear me, Geeta? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. So, when you talk about a uh, public event or the uh, or this construction of an event that never really happened, my question, mm -hmm. or rather the ramble, is that what happens to the faculty of imagination then, and what risks are involved in imagining such or in constructing such an event, and. In addition to that, when you talk about financial risk, is there mm -hmm. a political leverage to such risks as such? And how does one construct from that? Uh, I also have a question for Rashmi, and I think it's a slightly larger question, saying that in after compiling this book, or as Bindu points it, an open archive, uh, what registers do we read the image through now? And... Um, and I'm specifically saying this, uh, what registers do we read the image through or with? Which is also a question on spectatorship, saying that how does the person who's watching it read it through? And we see a trend or like this overarching frame where it's either a forensic manner of reading or either you read it through a lens of the ghost or the specter that the image throws at you, or it's a hyper-emotional landscape. That where you are just flooded by hyper affective recall value in a sense. So, is that something that you would adhere to, or do you think that the regime of reading images is completely shifted? Um, you are actually asking, uh, sort of, uh, asking for a conversation. But I, one of the things that's interesting is again working with a poet who wrote a Namukamal self portrait, right? So, literally incomplete self portrait has. Um, speculative pasts, right? And he, he believes in um, a kind of imaginative, the, the idea of the imaginative as in, and envisioning a past that never happened, right? So, so I think I'm asking, so one of the things, the reason I use the word nostalgia is very particular, right? So you can have imaginative, speculative pasts that never happened, and play with them. It's when you actually have a nostalgia 
literally a nostalgia as a particular form, right? That atta- that so that your the you are attached to that imaginative past and must not let it go in a way that you constitute that past as something if it is somebody makes you let it go you're living in a state of to use a freudian term melancholic loss right so i'm really interested in the way in which and that's it's a very so it's not imagination that's an issue it's not imaginative past that are an issue i mean as i said i i i translate from Urdu all of this writing that lives in Shayad, uh, hone wala tha, uh, you know, like literally past that are nothing but speculative, that are playful, that are, but the issue is, uh, can you release them? Can you, or do you have to be the kind of producer of the documentary, the, literally the documentary producer of your of this imaginative speculative past that you have to hold on to, and that if you lose it, you feel like you must make that loss up in blood. That's a very different sort of attachment to the idea of the imaginative. Does that make sense? So there are many different genres uh, forms ways through which the imaginative comes alive and some of them are more allow for more virulence than others and that's you know the the spectators and the co-composers decision to make right and it's that kind of it's the forms through which virulence in the in the kind of orchestration or protection from loss that happens that I'm interested in. I'm also interested in the others. I'm interested in what Drashmi did with this book, which is completely speculative. I've always loved Paramita's work because it's always offered me this unreliable witness, right? This literally, and pleasure, right? Um, you know, I, I work with the, this, the modernist poet Mirji, which by the way, who by the way, the progressives hate and still hate, hated and still hate in India. Uh, Because, you know, in the 1930s and 1940s, he played around with the idea of the I itself. It was completely, you didn't know what gender, sexuality, who the I was, literally. So he was playing with the I, but he wrote as a woman. Um, And so, and I want to, I don't, I mean, I don't, I don't want to stay too long because it's on this because there'll be other questions, but, um, and, you know, um, a question for Rashmi, which I, I think is really important, but how do we, I mean, I want to think about the political, what happens when you constitute the political through risk pooling, right? I want to, uh, that's the question I ask over and over again. And I've asked it of feminist communities. It's a question I forced into collective meetings in the 1990s in Bombay. I asked it of queer communities. What happens when you risk pool? What's the difference between risk pooling as a form of protection and risk pooling as a form of constantly remobilized pleasure, right? There, there's a different and danger, literally. So, and how do we then constitute a political through it? And I'm this is this is as much. It's for every community that we live in, right? Including the national political. And I think when we live through prophylactic risk pooling. We're in a certain kind of danger that's different than the danger this book offers, that's different than the danger that uh, Paro's eyes offer us, right, which is dangerous pleasure. Okay, so I'll start with uh, actually just responding briefly to what Gita is saying. Uh, this is a conversation that goes long back. You know, I've read your book and reviewed it and written about it, and mm-hmm. which is why I really uh, admire your work in the way in which you position both insurance and risk as being completely oppositional possibilities in so many ways. Um, And this idea of 
distributing risk and take the liberty of moving from that point of redistribution to the question on uh, registers mm -hmm. of moving images, right? And I'm actually going to respond to your question in a very literal way and use the word register as a register in which you keep khata, okay? And mm -hmm. I've always fantasized about images mm -hmm. Uh, through this idea of a republic of images. And I use that mm -hmm. phrase in the introduction uh, to the mm -hmm. book. Uh, because if we are going to think about register as the census, then you know mm -hmm. we collect demographic data of a particular kind vis-a-vis -vis mm -hmm. different image balances. Right? And that determines mm -hmm. their position in that register. Uh, I think that's perhaps not I mean, I, I suppose we've learned from history that that's not the most effective way of getting to know any object of, that we're interested in. Uh, and so ethnography will tell us that, you know, there's another way of getting to know the demographic and so on. So, so I think I'm interested in not answering that question about the different registers, because yes, we know that there are, you know, different registers. And my, I'm interested in uh, this in a political sense. Uh, because there is a certain kind of politics, a certain understanding of the world that is attached to the celluloid image, uh, which is mm -hmm. different to that which is attached to the video image and the and you know, you know all of this. Uh, so how do we think about mul multiplicities is what I'm interested in because Bindu used a very interesting term, recalcitrant. What mm -hmm. is recalcitrant? What, you know, why does the cinematic mm -hmm. keep reappearing? But I want to ask what is recalcitrant in the cinematic? And one can go back to older histories of the fairground, the spectacle, and that comes up now in new media, in VR, in animation, in virtual mm -hmm. reality, you know, and the fact that actually uh, the techno intimacies that Gita is also writing about, that the distance between image and spectator itself is diminishing, right? So mm -hmm. uh, I think we really uh, are asking questions to images that belong to the 20th century from the 21st century, but we're trapped in an image world which is actually 22nd century in some sense. So mm -hmm. I don't, I mean, that's obviously not an answer, but just to kind of think along with what you're proposing. I think we can move to, yeah, so um, thanks to both Gita and uh, Paramita and Rashmi for, you know, uh, giving us kind of new templates to think about, not just about the video and the archives and the celluloid, but also history itself, right? Many, many, mm -hmm. um, uh, many, uh, I think, new modes of thinking also emerged in the conversation. So I'm very grateful to that. Uh, but I also want to invite Ashish to uh, give a few closing remarks, thoughts on everything which transpired here. Uh, you don't have to particularly answer my question about, you know, uh, Pathan and, you know, your essay and what happens between that, etc. But in general to, you know, what has emerged in this room. Thank you. No, I mean, first of all, uh, you know, uh, thanks very much. Uh, you know, I too have my uh, associations with it. I just space and I'm sorry, I'm not there in person. Uh, I hope to be there next week or whenever the, the screenings happen. Um, uh, also, thanks very much to Bindu, to um, Paramita, with, uh, with whom, of course, as you know, Paramita, we, we've already trialed your essay in China uh, <laughs> in uh, rather unusual and, uh, and complex context. And, and, and thank very much, Gita, for uh, some really remarkable uh, insights. Um, I, uh, I do want to take a bit of a backseat because in some ways I think this is Rashmi's book and uh, I think it really represents everything that Rashmi has been, <laughs> been interested in and working on. Uh, and, you know, uh, it, it, it really, I mean, I, I just want to sort of just say a couple of quick things. Uh, you know, it is, it is an experiment as a whole series is an experiment with um, the idea of, an, of a book as an assemblage. Uh, mm -hmm. rather than an anthology, um, mm -hmm. in which uh, I think the idea is this, that if you have some kind of a curatorial insight, which doesn't, which, which should not be translated as clarity about what history we're talking about, but really some insight into what brings all this together, then you have to also be able, and this is what the series is all about, um, 
clear about what each work, whether it's a piece of text or an, or an image, is doing in that imagination. And then to actually work through juxtapositions and then, of course, as Rashmi points out, uh, you know, the support of the concerned artists and authors to allow you to do this, uh, this, this combination. Now, this becomes, I think, explicitly relevant for reasons that I think Gita has talked about, which is that we do have a problem here in the 90s. Uh, and, and, and Gita, I'm very much with you on many of the ways in which you've landmarked it. Uh, the question of neoliberalism, the question of actually what the 90s do in relation to an earlier earlier history, uh, I think the series has been very interested in that, and this particular volume does, I think, really take a whole leap forward. And this, I think, brings me to Shah Rukh Khan. Um, that particular essay uh, I wrote uh, uh, in the context of two films, really, My Name is Khan and uh, Ra One, which were both, and I saw Ra, Ra One and My Name is Khan as actually two halves of a larger whole uh, at that point of time. I mean, you know, one was this extraordinary story of a, of a person who lived in, in somewhere in Borivli, who then goes to the United States, and, and that history is very well known, along with this particular superhero sort of imagination, and a diagnosis that I think Shah Rukh Khan had made about what he thought at that time was the problem uh, with all of us, uh, and the larger problem with Indian cinema. Uh, and it was, I think, I, you know, in many ways, it echoes with what uh, Gita talks about as a past that never existed, are anxieties that Shah Rukh Khan himself seemed to have at that point of time. You know, he was talking about a situation that was, uh, I, you know, I mean, I, I have actually separately also argued, uh, Gita we must talk about this, of, of modernism in India as actually a, a narrative of loss, a narrative, I mean, especially Nehruvian kind of modernism. And that particular modernism with its, with its realist kind of privileged forms of realism and I think this has been a problem with Pathan as well, because I think a lot of people are trying to do a realist interpretation of Pathan and not quite knowing where to where to go mm -hmm. uh, with it. The idea of realism is something that is holding the the you know the the star or the mm -hmm. actor back from this fantasy. And at that point of time, he had actually spoken about about Heath Ledger and uh, Batman as an example of the kind of freedoms that he was uh, interested in. So. Um, you know, here what's happened is that what's, you know, I mean, with, of course, Patan, what we get is a certain um, phenomenon of an event. I mean, in the classic sense of, a, of an event. I mean, it could have been practically anything. It's just an event that the whole nation seems to have cottoned on to because that event is playing a role, uh, uh, almost a cathartic role of a certain kind, which is almost independent of the film. And I think this does relate, I suppose, to the the trolling of Bollywood and the kind of difficulties that previous uh, major films, I mean, of course, Amir Khan's... Uh, um, that uh, Lal Singh Chadda had, had had faced, and so it is a certain freedom from that. But the, I think the more complicated point here is really speaking: what is the idea of the future that the cinema was holding us back from? You know, I mean, what was what was the cinema preventing us from doing? And in this case, I think the argument was, and I think there in that essay, the Shahrukh Khan was sharing something with with Rajnikanth here in the way that you know they're literally trapped by the cinema. You know, they they're stuck in 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 the cinema. Uh, and, and this, I think, is really very interesting because the way by which you're able to look at the idea of, again, this past that never existed and the further idea of what we might call an unrepresentable present and maybe an unimaginable future, you know, is this particular character who seems to be wanting to kind of navigate his his way through this. Uh, in that particular essay, uh, which I think uh, Rashmi is, and, and, and Gauri Nakpal has so wonderfully Less, you know, visualized, I uh, had actually mm -hmm. looked at uh, the complete and utter failure of the game that had accompanied Ravan. I don't know if uh, either you've had a chance to look at that game. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a game on the Sony PlayStation 3, and it is an utter failure. Uh, and, and it was actually a moment in the game when actually. But the, the star has to just run for 30 seconds like mad, you know, to stop himself from being captured by the by the baddie who's there. I mean, it, it was a game that was utterly and completely a failure, precisely because it seemed to have been an impossibility, you know. I mean, I mean, it could not be Batman, and it could not, you know, because it was it was stuck by Roti Kapada or Makan, as, as Shahrukh Khan put it, you know, the idea that that those were the concerns that we have in India and not how to save planet Earth or something, something like that. So, so uh, I mean, th th there is a certain, um, shall I say, a historical um, moment that we are looking at in relation to this particular question. And so thank you very much, Gita. Uh, uh, you know, lovely to meet you, I think, for the first time and, you know, to, to hopefully continue with this. And once again, uh, my absolute congratulations to, to Rashmi for having pulled mm -hmm. this off. Uh, and thank you, Bindu. And... Um, 
and uh, everybody. For, you know, answering many questions and situating many other, you know, terms that emerged and so on. And also thanks for obliging to our request for the closing okay. remarks. Okay. So thanks everyone and Shubhashri IHS for holding this uh, book discussion and Paramita for coming. Uh, Geeta and Ashish for joining online and I don't know what time it is now in, in uh, Virginia. But many thanks on Rashmi's behalf and uh, mine. Yeah. In my own uh, terrible voice today. Thank you so much. Such a pleasure to see you both on screen and uh, wonderful audience. Yeah. yeah. Also, I just want to add that um, please buy the book or the books. So, if yeah. one had to buy it apart from Amazon, uh, how can one buy these books? You can go to the Tulika website. It's uh, they're on offer at discounted price. So right. Please now. go to the Tulika website and buy mm -hmm. this volume and the previous two volumes. Please uh, return our copies. Yes, Maybe that too. And Geeta, it was a pleasure having you. Uh, we hope we can see you at IHS and at the Urban Lens Festival uh, some year. And Ashish, I hope you'll be here next week attending yeah. the screenings. So, Yeah, I'll be there. I'll be there. Yes, great. Uh, and, yeah, thank you, actually. And, for, and it's lovely meeting Ashish. So. And to all of you, you're here. I know it's pretty late. Um, see you next week. We played the tra trailer twice. That wasn't an accident. So we hope to see you from 16th um, February onwards. Thanks a ton, Rashmi, Paramita, and Bindu. Thank you.